Well, hello there, friend. Welcome back to the Construction Leadership Podcast. I am your host, Bradley Hartman. I'm excited to bring to you today my conversation, one that's somewhat unique in that these two individuals worked at the same organization, Trex, for over 15 years and now collaborate as a manufacturer and distributor. You'll meet Mr. Chris Gerhard, who spent 15 years at Trex and is now at SBP, Specialty Building Products. And you'll also meet Mr. Brett Martz, who graduated from the University of Tennessee, national champions in baseball, and has worked at Trex ever since. He's their national sales leader. In this conversation, we talk about leadership we talk about innovation, we talk about some of their favorite mistakes and the kindest thing someone has ever done for both of them. You, my friend, are in for a treat. You will enjoy this conversation. There's a lot of fun. So without further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Mr. Chris Gerhardt of Specialty Building Products and Mr. Brett Martz of Trex. Mr. Chris Gerhardt, Brett Martz, welcome to the show. Great Thank to be you. here. Thanks. We're going to start out in a little unconventional way. Right. I'm going to say one name. Neither of you know who is coming. Brad, it's probably going to be more for you, but Chris, I mean, if you're feeling, feeling frisky, fr thank you, frisky, jump right in. The name, Roger Wittenberg. Who is he and why does he matter? Oh, you did your research. I mean, yeah, look at it. So Roger Wittenberg was, you know, technically the founder of Trex in the sense that an inventor years and years ago, probably 30 plus years ago now, came up with the original concept of Trex. There's a million stories that float around within the halls of Trex, but the one that I've always heard is, you know, he was a, affiliated with some farmers. They were taking day or week old bread and, and using that to feed chickens, right? And because of that, he saw a pile of plastic that was starting mm -hmm. to build up. And being who he was an inventor, he thought, well, I can combine the wood that's around on the farm with plastic and make fire logs. One thing that you find about Trex is it doesn't burn very well, <laughs> but it also doesn't yeah. rot, right? And, yeah. and so the way that Trex came to be is Roger invented this, realized it wasn't probably the best for a fire log. Eventually, ExxonMobil was looking for a way to, to use waste streams and bought the technology and it kind of took off from there and eventually became Trex. So that's what Roger Wittenberg means story. to me. Yeah. yeah. That's what you probably yeah. heard the same story, right? It is. Yeah. 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 And turn that into a, and, and it started as a really commercial industrial grade product. Now, yeah. now Roger, to see it today, I think you can imagine what his reaction would be to see what it's turned into, which is a true consumer product. And right. it's great. Yeah. Well, the, the line that I wrote down was 20 tractor loads of unwanted bread per day. So he was processing this, making breadcrumbs, and then just had this pile of plastic bags that was holding the loaves of bread. And they said, yeah, I went to start looking at logs and then park benches and then said, how many park benches are there in the United States? And then ultimately, so I, I knew none of this yeah. and was just fascinated. I do have a question. Maybe it's a request. I'm always looking for free gear. Is there any Rivenite or Timber X branding, maybe some trucker hats, from 25 years ago. Any of those still around? Well, let me think. We just moved into a new corporate office, but if I can dig some up, I'll make sure you <laughs> okay. get it. Don't forget, we had uh, bumpers for uh, parking lots too. That was yeah. the big yeah. one, right? Oh. Yeah, so if you think yeah. about the, the curbs that you have for in a parking lot. Yes. They used, originally that was what the Rivenite or Timbrex was used for as well. That makes so sense. It's pretty cool. There used to be some old marketing collateral on both those yeah. brands, but I never saw the product. Never saw samples. Yeah. I saw the old, old school samples, but not nothing that would be commercialized. I'm sure we've got something laying around. I'll find it for you. Somebody who said Timberx to Trex decking, there had to be a promotion in there. Somebody right there needed an attaboy. Yeah, there. if you think about where Trex came from, I mean, there were basically four gentlemen from ExxonMobil that bought Timberx at the time from ExxonMobil right. and, and took it private at the time and then eventually public. And one of those gentlemen was Andy Ferrari. He's still around. Okay. Um, marketing genius. I mean, guru from way back in the day. I think rumors are he's the hefty, hefty, hefty guy. That's the uh, If you yeah. think about that branding, it's a good little rumor. And yeah. and I think he, legs. and <laughs> and somehow he, you know, he figured out a way to, to to build out the Trex name, and and that's kind of where it, it started from. But pretty cool history. Yeah. Well, just looking at well, knowing you've been there for two decades, mm -hmm. Roger sells it for ten million to Mobile. Then him and three other guys buy it back three or four years later for 30. 
And then they go, and obviously you guys had what, over a billion dollars in sales last year. Mm-hmm. I, I didn't know any of this, obviously. Mm-hmm. I grew up in a lumber yard since I was 15, and Trex has been around since then. But not knowing any of this history, I thought was really kind of a fun place to yeah. start. That's a great mm-hmm. story. Yeah. Yeah. You guys have roughly, at least according to the annual report, roughly mm-hmm. 50% market share. Mm-hmm. And I think we'll start with Brett, and then I think, Chris, I'd love to kind of get your thoughts on the other side of the coin. Yeah. Is, Trex now, in some cases, could be argued, it's almost like Kleenex. You guys invented the category. It's been around for so long. You have some competitors that might start with the letter A, and maybe start with the letter F. But I think you have consumers or contractors that are saying, oh, it's like Trex, right? I'm just curious from the sales standpoint and the branding as you think about your focus on growing market share, my guess would be, obviously you got three giant customers that have a ton of volume with you, how to grow beyond that with independent lumber yards and such. How do you think about that of just knowing you guys have been so successful you are now in Kleenex territory, or do you guys not really think about that at all? We think about it. I mean, if you, first of all, you wouldn't trade the brand awareness for anything, Correct. right? I mean, so you'll take the the folks who have you out for a barbecue and they're like, look at my great Trex stack. And I'm like, eh, that's not Trex. And they're like, oh, I swear it's Trex. I'm like, oh, been there 20 years. We've never made that product, right? Yeah. But you still, you don't trade the brand awareness and it's, it's a huge asset. I think when I talk to Leslie, our VP of marketing, Leslie Atkins, the thing that we really focus on is how do we continue to differentiate? And it's product innovation. Obviously, we, we spend a tremendous amount of money continuing to invest in the brand and, and drive brand awareness and category awareness. But it's also the tools, assets, and resources we provide to our team, right? We want to go in and differentiate ourselves, not only because we're tracks in, in the product, but also what we offer our customers, right? So. How do we help you capitalize on on trends like digital marketing? How do we help you with e-commerce? How do we provide a different selling experience to you and provide tools and resources that candidly the other folks don't? And so really it's about differentiation. We'll continue to build the brand and, and drive brand awareness, but it's it's how you differentiate yourself, how you're that different when you walk through the door. Mm-hmm. Right? Now, Chris, as I think about SBP, specialty building products, strategy of acquisition how much do you think about hey as us lumber or dw distribution how much do you think about your own branding of sbp and do you want that known how do you think about that in terms of growing your own business it's a great question and that's new for us right so um, sbp would not be widely known to to everybody but uh, our operating brands would be Mm -hmm. right so the platform company us lumber you think of the growth of the business over time you know half of it's been organic but half through acquisition and that started with you know, names that people would know, Boston Cedar, Midwest Lumber, Mid-State, Nilco, Alexandria Molding, Reeb, Amerhart, MSI in Florida, DW where we sit here today. Those brands have strength mm-hmm. and there's ownership of those brands locally and, and there's a connection with customers. So don't want to disrupt that. But as we progress and go forward, the name SVP will carry weight to, to, in a consolidating market. Mm-hmm. Customers want to know the strength that you offer, the, the brand selection you have, the service proposition, you can, the value you deliver to the market. That needs to be under one umbrella. So we see it moving that way over time. But at the same time, we don't want to disrupt the power of the local brand. As you go throughout the country, you talked about meeting up with Brett last week or earlier this week. How do you think about connecting, building trust, helping independent dealers or the Kodiaks and the Mm USLBMs, et cetera, BFS, all those folks? How do you help them grow their business when there's such a wide spectrum of sophistication? Mm -hmm. I grew up in a lumberyard, Seagulls Home and Building Centers in Elgin, Illinois. That's what I knew. And then got out of college and started working on their sides. And I was like, oh, not everybody thinks about merchandising and branding and organization and revenue per square foot like they did. How do you think about collaborating with manufacturers, going up and down the chain to really help them grow their own businesses when we're at a time looking at commodity prices where they certainly are? And yet, my guess is you two gentlemen, it's not a good strategy to go in and say, you guys have no idea what you're doing here. Let me show you how it's done. We're smart. How do you guys think about that together? Well, it's in a complicated supply chain. So if you think of the manufacturer, the distributor, the retailer, the contractor, the builder, and then the consumer, right. how do you keep everybody on message to understand the value proposition that we both deliver together? That's the challenge. And so the value that we offer to our customer, the, the, the retailer, is the bundle of benefits we have and the products we choose to be in. So we're not in, in the commodity space. We're going we're gonna to be in specialty products that require value-added sales um, efforts on our part, that are skew intensive that require salesmanship. Mm-hmm. And so we do that in conjunction with the, with the supplier where 
know, they're going to do such a good job. And, and Trex is a great example of building an unbreakable bond with both the contractor and the consumer. It has morphed into a consumer brand, mm -hmm. right? So their work and their efforts downstream to convert contractors, to identify new contractors, and then and then build that bond to the consumer. So they're going looking for product and they come to the buying decision knowing really what they want. Our role in this is the service proposition that we deliver to the retailer. So the hope that we meet in the middle. We're doing such a good job with the breadth of our offering to the retailer. Trex or any other manufacturer who's you know, got a brand of space in those efforts is, is pulling through that business and it kind of meets in the middle. So if we're doing a good job of servicing and providing you know, product knowledge and sales training and the like at the dealer level, if that business is being brought in by Trex, um, that's a pretty unbreakable bond. And when you think about the, earlier in the conversation, thinking of that brand awareness and the Kleenex effect, when the sales pitch starts, we're like Trex, but mm -hmm. you've got them mm -hmm. in that give them what they want. And if we're doing our job on our side, we're, we're, we're providing you know, inventory solutions and, and product knowledge, and that's being met with the demand that's being generated downstream. And that's, that's, that's the marriage. I think it's unique too. I mean, we've been very fortunate to have a core group of distributors that we've kind of built this business together. And SBP has been, you know, a huge part of, of Trex's success over the last 20, 20 plus years, right? And, and with that comes a, a fair amount of collaboration and transparency. And I think that's a big deal, especially as our industry has evolved coming out of COVID and, and the technology platforms and, and some of the things that we look at. You know, we talked about a meeting Tuesday where we talked about what those platforms look like in the future and how we collectively help bring, you know, what the what's challenging our dealers, how we bring that kind of home to them and help them get through that. Right. Because ultimately it, where we're at as a, as a consumer product is we want to have our product available where the consumer chooses to shop. Mm -hmm. Right. And we're not going to be able to dictate in the future where the cons consumer chooses to shop. If they want to go through e-commerce because that's what they've grown up and that's what right. they're accustomed to. We're going to have to figure out how to, how to do that and how to do that within the auspices of the current supply chain. And we've had great conversations about what that looks like. We, we don't have it figured out, trust me, but we're having those conversations. We're collaborating. We're trying to solve for those issues. And I think when you can get to that point, mm -hmm. you know, you're, you're well ahead of everyone else in, in that aspect. And that's key because we don't need to duplicate efforts, right? The business is complicated enough. If we, if we communicate well enough, we know what the other one's doing. And we can support that in the right way to get you know, the desired result. And so that lack of duplication of efforts is really the magic that allows us to work together and you know, plan for the future. Understand what we need, what what what's our value proposition and what how it's going to change. And that could be as simple as all right, what's what's our e-commerce strategy, right? How are we going to approach the, the future of the business together? But that comes just with a constant communication and the frequency of that to make sure that we're working on the same things together and that we have the right expectations of each other. Right. What have you found to be successful? as you think kind of all the way down to the contractor with the homeowner, in terms of thinking differently, we hear a lot about, well, this is the way we've always done it. And we're all here, we spend most of our time with dealers and the dealers will say, well, dude, these contractors, they can't get out of their own way when it comes to marketing and using social media. Well, then you talk to a distributor who's dealing with the dealers and they're like, these guys, we're still talking about whether or not they should have a website. You guys are trying to give them right. e-commerce and they're like, eh, I'm not sure if we're ready for that. I'm not sure if my customer wants sure. it. And then you move all the way up. What have you found successful when obviously both of you and the organizations you're with are successful with innovation? Part of what is going to make you successful is encouraging other people to adopt that faster. Take this either way you want. This is what has worked or I'll tell you what is on our not to do list because we know this doesn't work. I'll go first. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, I've got, I've got, I've got, I've got, an, yeah. I've got an opinion, and and yeah. so and some of that is is the voice of the customer matters, mm -hmm. right? They don't want to be sold or pushed in a direction that doesn't feel right for their business. But if the path to future growth, future margin expansion, if, if that is the recipe, then there's a lesson to be to mm -hmm. be taught there. And you know, consolidation in the market gets your point where not everyone's going to do it the same way. Yeah. And so, the, you know, so we've got to figure out what fits for that retailer, that customer, to understand the sales benefit to alignment. Mm -hmm. and, and some of that's trying to, in many cases, disrupt a guaranteed sale, which is difficult. So take trucks, for instance. A lot of wood conversion, that's the story. That's, that's the growth engine for yeah. all of us going forward. And in many cases, no one's going to a showroom to buy pressure-treated lumber, right? They're calling and say, I need X delivered Tuesday. Correct. Well, to understand the, the, the financial benefit and giving you know, a desired product to that end user, 
to step in and disrupt that and say, you know, I, I can do that, mm -hmm. but have you thought of this? And trying to weave that in the conversation just from an educational standpoint and give options. The options allow them to choose. And in many cases, they're going to do what's in their financial best, best interest. But it's, it's understanding the voice of the customer to make sure that you're delivering the value and the services that they require. Yeah. And I'll go further downstream. We've put together and put together a team in the field that's focused on the contractor. You know, we've got a Trex Pro program that, that we utilize, and that provides leads and, and all kinds of access okay. to different Trex materials and different Trex products and, and branding opportunities and things like that. But at the core of that is education, right? We want that contractor to be able to sit there in front of the consumer and tell them why Trex is better and, and why they should use Trex. Now, behind the scenes, you know, we're helping them with digital platforms to help, help make them better marketers. We have a huge national spend. They can leverage that on a local scale. We try to provide tools, like I said, again, that differentiate assets, resources to make their businesses more efficient and more effective. It's interesting because once we get to the consumer, it's, it's, it falls into our marketing department and it's really what we do day in and day out, which is heavy focus on tracks and the tracks brand and brand awareness and category awareness too. So it's a bifurcated approach for us. Mm -hmm. SPP does a phenomenal job with the dealers. We're certainly involved. But we're trying to get downstream from that a little bit and get in front of those contractors and, and make sure that that they understand the features and benefits of Trex when that consumer asks, they can they can pass it along. So I'll, I'll tee this up for you, Brett, but I think it applies to both you guys. As you guys think about growing the business, offering more SKUs, but also doing this in a measured way. The number of companies that have grown said, oh, I started in this and now they're doing this. You could name a bunch of them. The number of companies that have overreached and said, well, we're doing this, this, and this, we can be vertically integrated. Mm -hmm. And as I look at, obviously, decking, but you're getting into rails, we're getting into fasteners, we're into substructures. How do you guys think about, or when it comes to decision-making, kind of that risk reward versus, hey, a lot of this makes sense, but I think all these companies that have thought about that, mm -hmm. successful or not, it always looked like a good opportunity up front. Mm -hmm. How might you guys think about that as you guys you know, plan the next five years, Brad. Yeah, it's a comprehensive process that we go through as an executive team. We look at the TAM, right? So we look at the total addressable market. Obviously, we're publicly traded. We're going to look at whether or not you can be profitable. It's great if you mm -hmm. can sell $100 million or something. But if you can't make any money on it, right. does it really make sense for, for the business? And then ultimately, you know, does it fit into what we're pursuing right now, which is that outdoor living envelope. It doesn't mean we'll forever be there, but right now, I mean, that's what we're focused on. And and so you see a lot of expansion from tracks on decking, on railing, fasteners, uh, mm -hmm. something we got into this year. They're all basically adjacent to outdoor living or part of outdoor living, and they kind of fit in to our selling process. That way it keeps it pretty concise for our team. And then for us, it's a ton of education mm -hmm. uh, with our sellers, right? So our sales team out in the field, we're spending consistent time training them and making sure they understand, you know, how the, how our products work, why our products are where they are and what those addressable markets are and why they make sense for Trex. And so we're going to trust the voice of the manufacturer there that, you know, Trex's reach and opportunity to grow in adjacent categories is good for both of our businesses. And you know, at SVP, we think that we're, we're going to align with top tier brands and the categories in which we sell. And so the expectation is those manufacturers are seeing the future and, you know, the more complex the line, the better for us, right? That's, you know, skew intensive that offers value that we can deliver. Um, there's a saying at our, in, within the office by a team member that, you know, where, where, where we can add value, we belong in the transaction and where we don't, we don't. And so those lines as they expand, you know, within reason, right? And it's, it's not just going to 20,000 SKUs because we need more widgets to sell because mm -hmm. it can be good for our top and bottom line. You know, we're gonna support the strategy that, that is that bridge to growth um, across that product expansion. So, you know, we like the notion of new products. It gives us a message to talk to the market about, right? Mm -hmm. You sit down with a customer and, and most times they want, okay, what's new, right? So, and, and they want to be with innovative manufacturers, right? So all that weaves together in terms of what's, what value are you as a, co a combined, you know, sales engine, you know, manufacturing and distribution, what value to provide? And a lot of that is what's next. And they're expecting brands like Trex to, to deliver what's next for them. Yeah. What has worked well, take it any way you guys want, either one of you, in terms of just education, when obviously folks at DW, down to the dealers, part of what they're trying to figure out, if I'm a salesman, is like, man, what moves? And how do I make money? And how do I get my commissions? Mm -hmm. And I don't know. So part of this I've just seen is, I was asked, why are you really pushing this with this contractor? And the answer is, 
there's a brief, memorable story that this individual likes. As you guys are, and we'll broaden this maybe to education externally with people you partner with or internally with training, what have you found works well as we're sitting here in 2024 in terms of this is education, this is training where you guys leave and you're like, all right, I think they got it. And then months down the road, you see the revenue from that and you're like, all right, we know that worked. What's working best for you guys? So twofold on, on, from, from our position and, and I will weave in some of the, what we're doing with Trex there is that some of that's online, some of that's in person and some of that's in the field, right? And some of that's based on the customer you're trying to reach. But, you know, Reeve Millwork for us on the door side has a wonderful online training um, toolbox that yep. allows everyone to yep. be well, you know, really well in, um, in touch with the, you know, the iterations of products and, and, and leaves them with confidence on what to sell. You couple that with, say, a mill tour and you know, Trex has what they call Trex University. Yeah which is hands-on install training, a view of the plant, but also gives a chance to show the trajectory of the category and, and where the relevance is for Trex and us and, and why they should be aligned. So you know, the constant communication, some of that's hands-on, some of it's online, and allowing people to get the information as they want it is an important component of that too. Second, what Chris said as far as the in-person, I think works the best for product knowledge. I mean, you got to touch it, feel it, you know, right. see what we're talking about, install it. So for our people, we tend to our team we tend to do a couple in-person trainings a year we try to get them together whenever they have regional meetings or national sales meetings you know one step further to the consumer we've put together a pretty thorough youtube video collection of how to's okay. so how to install tracks you know and they're short some of them are short five minute videos about blind fastening or hidden fasteners or how to install a rail that seemed to pick up a lot of momentum the last couple of years because somebody, you know, maybe they can't find a contractor right. or they want to do it themselves, but it's a little intimidating. And to be able to go online and just look at a video and understand how to do something, um, we think that's really big dividends for us as far as getting further down to the consumer. Absolutely. Case in point, we're here at DW today and we had two groups come through, right? And a chance to see our facility, see the products we sell. And in many cases, it's, I didn't know you sold that, mm -hmm. right? So that one-on-one -on -one focus with customers to be able to see what the total value proposition is, is valuable to do in person also. Yeah. So Brett, you've spent, you graduated from University of Tennessee, mm -hmm. started working at Trex. Mm -hmm. That's the end of the current start here. You've been there the entire time. Mm -hmm. Your story, we're hearing more and more like, this doesn't happen. Guys don't graduate and whatever. Early mm -hmm. 2000s, stay with one company. They got to bounce around. When it comes to attracting and retaining top talent, what have you seen Trex do so well mm -hmm. that made you want to stay? And how are you doing that with the folks who are coming out of school now to do the same thing? We've been fortunate, Trex. We've had a lot of tenure there, and we still have a lot of tenure on our staff. And, and we've been able to bring some, some new folks into the fold as well, which has been great. But it gave us a different perspective. But as far as attracting talent. I think one of the things that we do that's pretty unique is we bring a, a group of people right out of college or one or two years experience into the group and they start calling on our retailers. And that's been a great conduit for us the last couple of years to get them trained on, on the basics of selling and understand the products. And then a lot of them have moved into the pro side of the business and started calling on dealers and contractors mm -hmm. and things like that. So that's been great as far as attracting talent, right? Having that the ability to to bring somebody right out of college into your organization and, and kind of acclimate them to the culture and, and get them exposed to, to Trex has been huge. As far as retaining talent, one of the reasons that I love Trex that have always been here and, and some of my directors tell me the day is you always felt like you could make a difference. You always felt like you were empowered. You know, when Chris and I worked together, Chris would very rarely say, this is what you should do. He said, what do you want to do? Right. And that was a big deal because you always felt like you were in control of your business. So while it was a big organization, it was very entrepreneurial in that sense, right? And you always felt like you had support and good leadership to kind of help you develop. And I think for a lot of people, you'd love to think that everybody's going to get promoted. Um, but we spent a lot of time giving our people training, you know, on financial acumen and how to run businesses and things like that, because you want them to feel like they're bettering themselves, mm -hmm. building a resume. I mean, you hope you're, they're building a resume to, to progress through tracks, but they're always in control of their future and they're, they're moving mm -hmm. forward and, and becoming better at, at their profession. Chris, does any story in your collaboration with Brett, when you guys were working together, stand out in your mind, just in terms of either your incredible mentorship of Brett or how as a mentee or someone younger learning the business or maybe not learning the business. I know because he, Brett, you were there when Chris joined, correct? Yeah. 
Were you part? Were you involved? Whether or not to hire this gentleman? No, that no, was okay. not me. Well, let's back up for a second. Okay. So Brett was part of an interview panel when I when I first joined the company. So we That's did fair. spend some time, and, and Brett was in a different role at the time, uh, and so I, maybe there's a stamp of approval. I don't, I don't know. But <laughs> did you um, fire any zingers? Do you remember? <laughs> I don't. That was a long time ago. I just remember Chris was coming from the food industry, and I was trying to figure out how that made any sense. But obviously, it did. It made a ton Talking of about sense. So. Twenty tractor loads of unwanted bread. I know. This is right? it, all, it all weaves together. That also tells you how yeah. inefficient the bread industry is, right? I mean, if you, you got that you much that bread, long. right? Uh, yes, there was more opportunities there. Um, what, what stands out in your mind just from your time together when you guys work together? Yeah, there, there are a few things. So I'm incredibly proud of the work that Brett's done, especially in this new role. So he had a rare balance of financial background and acumen and coupled with a, a sales approach, which is kind of not the norm, mm -hmm. right? You're either focused in one lane or the other. But I think most memorably, you know, you know, back when Trex was at its worst, and probably in, in the mid 2000s, maybe 07, 08, quality problems, um, Competitive entries were coming in the market that 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 raised the bar and the expectation of the category, and we had a fractured distribution base. And so, you know, you know Brett at the time was in a, in, a, in a market that that needed some change. And and through that, we stayed true. And Brett, more than most, stayed true to the principles of the business and said, okay, if the behavior is not going to be in a, at a level that we'd expect, if we can't believe in ourselves, then we can't. Then then it's a house of cards. So having conviction in the path of the business in, in, in the midst of distribution changes, which at the time was, was probably the most critical juncture of the company with competitors coming in and, and, and seeing the long game at that stage of his career was, you know, obviously insightful into how he's grown um, into, the, into the role he has today. Tell me a little bit, Brett, about coming out of or kind of during this period going into COVID. I think mm -hmm. the whole industry you know, we thought, you know, Great Recession 2.0 was coming back mm -hmm. around in the first quarter of 2020. And then we had to take both our feet off the brake and then jam them both on the gas at the same time. And it's been like that for a while. Now, all of a sudden, things are kind of settling. What have you learned just about oscillating your own leadership style and your communication about your sales team that I guess is from a high level, the mission doesn't change, which is to continue to dominate what has that been like for you? Yeah, and Chris was with, you know, Chris and I were working together at the time at Trex when COVID kind of kicked off. And, you know, that I don't think anything will replace those first two months as far as what do we do? What's right. going to happen? You know, right. where is this going to end up? And then, you know, you quickly pivot into a situation where you're sold out mm. and you're on allocation, right? And that was pretty much industry-wide. And so whether you were at a manufacturer or distributor, you were basically telling your customers what they could buy from you which hopefully never happens in our lifetime again. That wasn't the most fun, but it created some dynamic challenges around pricing. You know, we right. had this rampant es escalation of inflationary pressure across all kinds of raw materials and inputs. And then you come out of COVID and your organization says they're energized and they're charged, but those muscles haven't been flexed in a while, yeah. right? And so now you're tr they're trying to figure out like, where do I go? How do I do it? The environment's a little different. Your customers aren't necessarily as accommodating as they were before. If you're coming through the door, they want you to bring value. They don't want you just to be there to say hello. Yeah. And so you had to kind of rethink about how you went to, to market and, and really focus on getting your people's mindset back into let's go sell again yeah. um, and, and be assertive. And I think all along the way, you had to remember to be consistent you couldn't pivot every three months and kind of change what you were telling, right? I think any any good leader, especially on the sales side of the business, is you give them, a, you set a couple key targets or a couple key metrics and you stick to it, right? And you have to be resolute. I mean, you can't do it until you run it into the ground, but, mm -hmm. but you can't continually pivot because you'll just, you'll never get anything accomplished, right? Yeah. And so it was different. I mean, there was a lot of resilience that had to be involved there as, as you try to get folks out and some people weren't comfortable being in the field for a while, but you know, you come out on the other side and, and you're proud of what you and your team got accomplished and you think you're better off for it, right? Well, it's interesting. I haven't thought much about that, but the word pivot in general mm -hmm. carries a positive connotation. However, sports nerds, uh, you pivot multiple times at the basketball, you've just done a 360, right? So <laughs> I hadn't thought about it, but you're right. If you were coming in and were constantly pivoting, we're like, hey, let's switch this. Mm -hmm. On the other end of that message, someone's like, dude, What's your deal? Yeah. Just help me, mm -hmm. right? Do what I'm trying to do here. 
you know, that line Brett referred to earlier of what do you want to do instead of, I probably default to this, which is like, <clears throat> step aside. Here's what you need to do. Yeah. Just do this, yep. this, this. It's not that hard. Not a great leadership style. Giving them, hoping they think along these lines. Is there anything as you think about your leadership mm-hmm. journey, Chris, any lines or phrases that you use with people to give them some authority, give them some autonomy, give them some room to make a decision and even potentially fail that come to mind that might be instructive? So I struggle with that early on. I mean, you, you, the instinct is to, to take control and you right. see a situation, you run at it. Yeah. And you do that a couple of times and you realize the, the demotivation that takes place in any relationships you, you would have. But it's not, you know, I've been fortunate to have you know, mentors and influencers in my life that have kind of you know, shaped my, my belief in how to work with people. Right. So the framework of, you know, of approaching that, that we work together, you know, you know, brings in a conversation of, of how do we do this together? You know, let's, let's talk about options. And, and so if you're going to bring a problem to the surface, a proposed solution has to accompany that. Right. We'll work on that together, but don't come to all, just just for answers. And we're going to do this together and, and you need to have a voice in that. That's empowering. Right. And that that builds a sense of community and trust that we can work on this together. And and you want to you want to you get to a point in your career where you want to surround yourself with so much talent that you make yourself superfluous. Yes. I'm, I'm not doing great. <laughs> uh, but yes, this idea, this whole idea of like, how do we get a self-managing business? You got a few things that are kind of self-managing. You're like, look at this. This thing just runs. Yeah. And other ones, I'm like, I'm a total failure. But enough about me. Brett, let's talk about you. I call this my Cheryl Crow question. Do you have a favorite mistake where maybe at the moment in time, it hurt like hell, and maybe it was public, maybe it was private, but it was undoubtedly a mistake. But looking back on it, you value that because you've learned so much from it. Yeah, I don't know if there's one that sticks out. I mean, I think if I go back to how I was as a young manager versus as I grew and evolved, I mean, I could go into some dealer stories that wouldn't be appropriate for this just with the conversations that were had, but I'll still can I'll still contend they weren't mistakes, but whatever. No, it's, it's all good. <laughs> You'll double down? No, no, I'll double down on those. But, you know, I think about, and Chris kind of hit on it in a second ago, when you're a young manager, you know, that pace setting, I think all inherently all good salespeople are pace setters. And what do you mean by that? And what I mean by that is, you know, you've got a problem, you've got a challenge. Your per- one of your employees is trying to address that problem. And you say, you know what, forget it. Don't worry about it. I'll just go do it because I can do it. Right. Yes. And I think you find a lot of young managers, it, it's not one mistake, but it's a multitude of mistakes because they never develop their people because they're always doing it for them. Mm-hmm. Right. Their pace setting. And got I've it. watched that as, as, with a lot of our management team and, and talk to them about, do you realize that you don't do it? Because then you find yourself getting frustrated with your employees yeah. because they don't learn and they never get better at that particular, whatever that challenge has been, they, they consistently come to you, but you de- demotivate them, right? Yeah. You don't let them learn. You don't let them make mistakes and, and grow as, as a professional. So that was probably my biggest learning early on. If it, I don't know if it was one particular mistake, but it was, trust your people and, and let them learn along the way and make sure that you support them as you do that, right? That's probably been yeah. the biggest for me. Well, especially for sales managers. Mm-hmm. I think that's one of the hardest things. A lot of times sales managers get in that role because they are successful in selling Correct. and it takes yeah. so much restraint to just, I know you think you know the answer. You probably know the guy on the other end. You got to let him do it. That's just, the, it's one yeah. of the hardest things. It was, um, I had the conversation a couple of weeks ago so-and-so just they don't get it they don't know how to to do this pitch blah 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 and i said well i've sat through three of the pitches and you've done all three so how are they supposed to learn if you're not letting them do it right yeah. and so it's the same thing you got to trust and and just it's something you i think you learn as you mature and build up over time yeah you got a favorite mistake chris well there are a bunch to choose from no doubt <laughs> but i think one that comes to mind uh would be early in my career as a as a, as a salesperson in a different industry had put together pre- what I thought was at the time a seismic deal and celebrated too soon and oh. it fell apart at the end. And so it, so that was, that was a coachable moment for me in that sometimes handshake deals don't always mean we're done and let's, let's, fin- let's follow through to the end before we, we celebrate. And so that, that's always been in the back of my head. That's, you know, you know the, the, the finality of some deals, you know, it comes at different stages of those of, of those yeah. conversations. But 
I think being surprised that it didn't, the, the end game wasn't what I thought on the mm-hmm. timeline I thought um, was awakening to me to, as, as a young seller to see that there's a, there's a process here and we got to follow that. I'm not going to ask you about yeah. the deal. Yeah. I will ask you about the celebration. Yeah. What did you, did you, did you buy the Benz? What did you do? Hopefully it was epic. Okay. No, no, <laughs> not so much a personal celebration as there was a lot of fanfare around the size and uh, scale of the deal with the company. And uh, we had moved forward and, and things were in motion, even on behalf of the, of the, of the customer. And things were, and at the last second, someone stepped in at a higher level and, and, and swept our legs and the deal went away. And so another le- learning there was that you've got to build uh, more consensus than just one individual mm-hmm. in any decision-making process. So that was a learning too, but uh, nothing personal. I'm not going to share them, but that triggers yeah. like four different stories. But uh, <laughs> Amen. Know that. All right. I got two uh, relatively quick questions for you guys. Uh, the, the questions will be short. The answers do not need to be. Brett, I'll start with you. Do you have any book that maybe has been gifted to you, you gifted to someone else, or you have read that has influenced maybe a certain part of your career or your career that you would recommend that really stands out? Top of mind, one that I just read was The Unfinished Leader. Um, okay. I thought that was a great book, but I thought that was great. It just kind of talks about how leaders, like enterprise leadership and how leaders interact with an organization and impact they have. So I thought it was okay. pretty meaningful there. You know, I've gleaned a lot off of some Harvard Business Review articles we've read about, and we're really into this part now about establishing culture within our sales organization. We've got a lot of, of young, new leaders. So how their actions impact their their teams and, and how to build a team and, you know, what is pace setting versus being a visionary leader yeah. versus, you know, empowering and coaching and, and those kind of things. So it's a mismatch of things. I mean, there's some other ones out there but that's probably the one right now that's top of mind. Well, I think you bring up a good point. Oftentimes we'll have folks like, yeah, I'm not really into reading or where if you can get a Harvard Business Review article or something similar, it might be, you know, three or 4,000 words. Mm -hmm. It's still going to take some digestion. There's enough meat on that, but it's not 70,000 words. It's not a 250 page book. So I really like that. I think sometimes guys are like, yeah, I'm not a book reader. I don't really like to listen to Audible. So then it's like, well, if it's, no books there's nothing when there's a whole range of things i think that article is a great idea yeah it's awesome there's a couple really good ones out there yeah so when i was a, a young manager a mentor of mine gave me first break all the rules okay right? which is an introduction to management to those who would be coming into a new position and so that's been one i've handed out and the, the, the theme and the philosophy behind it is everybody's different people need mm-hmm. to be managed differently and you need yeah. to take an interest in life what's important to them and so there's not one size fits all and so that digs into that and that's one that's always kind of stuck with me and i've given that out to others and it kind of has a special place in my heart. Final question. I've heard this. There's a podcast I listen to. I really like it. It's called Invest Like the Best. Patrick O'Shaughnessy, the host, asks this at the end. And for a while I've listened, I'm like, dude, I kind of hate this question. I would never ask this on my podcast. And the more I've listened to it, I heard a couple of answers come out. I've never asked this question. So both of you, I don't know if we have a trophy or anything for you, but I uh, should be very proud. This is the original question that I've stolen from somebody else in their podcast. The question is, Chris, we'll start with you. What's the kindest thing someone has ever done for you? It's a great question. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it felt important at the time, but it felt it feels even more gracious now. So when I graduate from college, my parents um, were able to wipe out my student debt. And that, if I look back in time, that would have set me up to, to not have to worry about things that many have to, right? And let me take a path you know, that wasn't exactly linear to get here, but allowed me to do the things that I want to do at a certain stage of my career from a work standpoint and try new things. And so I, I look back on that as the most generous, gracious gift I've, I've been given. That's a great answer. Yeah, Brett? Mine's in line with family too. Um, back half of COVID, my father passed away. And we, you know, it was a mess. You're trying to plan a funeral. We're in Nashville. We live in Virginia and it's a long way away. And I remember coming out of, everything we get home and my buddies from home had set up a dinner for my entire family so that was hands down probably the best thing anybody's ever done for me solid group of guys yeah it was awesome that's amazing well cool um gentlemen i know you're busy i appreciate you guys making time for this yeah thanks a lot i enjoyed this it was awesome great to be with you chris thank you thank you All right, then, friends, how did that go? Hopefully you enjoyed my conversation with Mr. Chris Gerhard and Brett 
Marts. If you got value from this episode with Chris and Brett, please share it with your network. People around you are looking to leaders like you to figure out where to invest their limited time and attention. And if you get a moment, please rate and review us on whatever podcast platform you're listening to or where you're watching this video. That always helps us grow our reach as we strive to bring our construction community together. All right, I'm done. That's all we got. You, my friend, are owed nothing. Deliver value first. Make it a great week.